Welcome everybody. Okay, uh, I think all of my colleagues are here with me. Uh, welcome, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the AAAS mini case webinar on science and technology policy during COVID-19. I am Joanne Carney, AAAS's Chief Government Relations Officer, and we are all so excited to have so many of you join us for the next two hours. Uh, there are over 700 people that registered, um, and we know that you all are very excited to learn about the role that science plays in policymaking and how the pandemic has impacted the way we advocate. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the vital role that science plays in tackling global challenges and decision makers are looking to science for solutions. Uh, there's a reason why Fauci, uh, Dr. Fauci is now <laughs> kind of a meme and, and uh, you know, incorporated into Saturday Night Live. Um, science is, is taken seriously. And at the same, but at the same time, our research institutions have had to shutter portions of their campus and the path to reopening our universities is still uncertain. And though this has dramatically changed the way we live and communicate with one another, the future of research and education, it is still vital to remember that scientists just like you have a voice in the decision making process. So we're very excited to be having this webinar. It's the first of what we hope will be many. Uh, during this webinar, you'll receive a brief overview of the federal policymaking process, the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on these processes and on the research community, as well as ways that you can be an advocate for science. And during uh, the presentations, we ask that you submit your questions using the Zoom question box. Um, as I mentioned, there are over 700 people that have registered, so we may not be able to answer all of your questions, uh, but we'll try to respond to as many as we can uh, at the end of all of the sessions during the Q&A with all speakers. Um, and we will also follow up with you as, as much as possible afterwards um, and try to respond to your questions. Um, as well. So uh, with that, I am going to turn to our first speaker, who is Matt Hurahan, my colleague here at AAAS. He's the director of the AAAS R&D Budget and Policy Program, and he will give you an overview of the R&D budgets under COVID-19. Matt? Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Let me get this set up properly. There we go. Um, Hello, everybody. Nice to be with you uh, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're, uh, uh, you're joining us from. Um, so I am going to try to uh, set the stage a little bit, uh, talk about where we are and where, we're, where we might be headed um, regarding federal research spending. Um, so where we are is, uh, of course, in the 2020 fiscal year, um, there have been uh, quite a few research disruptions, of course, because of the virus. Uh, and multiple rounds of emergency spending. I'll, I'll talk about those uh, a little bit. Uh, where we're headed is the 2021 fiscal year, which starts October 1st. Um, preparations are late this year because of the uh, because of the crisis, uh, but looks like we're going to be getting um, spending bill votes uh, at the end of this month or beginning of the next month uh, in July. Um, but because of the both the virus as well as the upcoming election. Uh, and Congress's general inability to get spending done on time, um, we're probably looking at a, a stopgap um, at least for a few months uh, through the election, um, through you know much of the fall. Uh, maybe we'll get final appropriations in December, although it, you know, they, they, it could take uh, even longer than that. Um, and then we're not going to have a lot of time to look beyond next year, but I did want to just very briefly mention the fact that um, once we get beyond 2021 into 2022 and, and for years really uh, beyond, um, there are quite a few fiscal headwinds um, uh, facing research funding. Um, and so, you know, when we think about and you think about engaging um, uh, and trying to have an impact on uh, the science funding process and the, you know, the policy process, um, I'd encourage you to think uh, think in long terms, right? We're not just doing this just for this year or next year. We're doing this to, to lay a, uh, a stronger long-term foundation 
uh, that'll hopefully strengthen the research enterprise uh, for uh, for years to come. Um, because this debate really is a, a multi-year, long-term kind of debate. Um, um, and, you know, and frankly, science funding has had a lot of successes over the years um, because of uh, a lot of that um, uh, that commitment and that uh, sustained uh, sustained effort. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of the current fiscal year and the current situation, obviously, um, probably not a surprise to you, uh, COVID-19 has had some pretty major impacts on the research enterprise. Um, Toby, Toby's going to um, talk a bit about universities uh, and students and researchers. Uh, but on the federal agency side, um, there have been substantial disruptions. We've had uh, agency closures, uh, federal lab uh, closures. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, suspended or, or delayed projects. For example, uh, NASA suspended work on the uh, Jim Webb Space Telescope uh, and is likely going to have to postpone or push back its launch date, which was uh, scheduled for early, I want to say, I believe it was March 2021. Um, that date's going to have to slip because of the virus. Uh, we've had, you know, travel cancellations, conference cancellations, um, and even where work can continue, you know, say via telework, obviously that, as I'm sure we're all aware, can, uh, can affect uh, efficiency, productivity. Um, and it's also meant additional costs for, uh, for federal science agencies and federal labs. Um, you know, for example, some labs have had to take on increased uh, janitorial services um, to increase, you know, cleaning or decontamination uh, you know, to avoid uh, spreading the virus. Um, you know, it has meant uh, additional and unplanned investments in, say, IT infrastructure or other infrastructure to, to allow telework. Um, you know, it's it's it has meant delays in uh, you know, in uh, um, or, or reduced um, availability of, of, of equipment um, uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps delayed maintenance or, or, uh, or upgrades. I read an interesting um, uh, kind of humorous uh, anecdote about a, a, an American physicist who's overseeing uh, an upgrade to a particular piece of equipment at CERN uh, in, uh, in Europe, in Switzerland. And, um, uh, and, uh, and this physicist was, was, was supervising um, the, this equipment upgrade and installation over Zoom. And so the technician in Europe would do a little bit of work um, to install you know, a part of this equipment and then have to stop and point the camera at what, uh, what, what he just did. And then the physicist would, would see it and they'd talk and then they'd do a little bit more work and then stop and go back to Zoom and, and, and so on. So you can imagine you know, that kind of uh, activity and those kinds of slowdowns can really have an impact on, uh, on costs. Uh, and so there, you know, the, these kinds of things and, and having to shut down and start up equipment, all of it can 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 add up to uh, pretty substantial um, unplanned costs for federal agencies uh, and federal labs. Uh, so in response, not just to try to address the virus directly, but to help agencies and labs um, uh, bridge the gap and manage the transition, uh, Congress has so far adopted four rounds of uh, emergency appropriations. Uh, smallest was about $8 billion. Uh, largest, uh, the CARES Act was uh, net, I believe, 1.7 or 1.8 uh, trillion dollars. Uh, cumulative spending has been about 2.4 trillion dollars net, uh, and that's pretty big. The federal budget uh, annually is about five trillion. So, you know, we've increased federal spending by about 50 percent this year alone, uh, and we're probably not done yet. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, and in terms of the research spending that's been provided uh, in uh, in these appropriations, you can. Um, you can see some of the numbers here. Obviously, the big expenditures have been billions for, uh, you know, viral research at NIH, um, uh, 7.5 billion for CDC, uh, also 6.5 billion for BARDA. That's the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Agency. Uh, they're responsible for vaccine uh, development and acquisition. Um, in addition, you know, some of that money's gone towards uh, uh, the testing technology and, and a lot of other uh, things associated with the. Uh, with research and response. But in addition, uh, Congress has provided millions for several other agencies. Some of those are listed here. Uh, and a lot of this funding has actually been for, uh, for simp simply helping labs transition to kind of this new normal uh, and dealing with some of those unplanned costs that I mentioned. Um, so obviously there has been uh, quite a bit of an appetite in supporting research uh, in previous rounds of, uh, of, uh, of stimulus and emergency response. Uh, and that, ap that appetite is still there. Um, 
Senate Majority Leader uh, McConnell has said that there's going to be um, one more round, probably no more than one more round of uh, emergency spending. Um, but I, you know, I think most folks uh, understand there's still an appetite for uh, for another round. Um, House Democrats have already uh, thrown their uh, uh, or, or taken their the first bite at the apple, uh, so to speak, by passing the Heroes Act a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is a huge bill. Uh, it's about three and a half trillion, so you know, larger than uh, the previous response combined. Um, uh, contains a lot of different things. It's most likely dead as it's currently written in the Senate, um, but it does contain billions more for NIH plus funding for uh, NSF, the Census Bureau, um, EPA, U.S. Geological Survey, and some others. So uh, there's definitely still quite a bit of appetite um, for uh, securing research support in the next round of stimulus. When that's going to happen and what that's going to look like, it's still to be determined. Um, but there is an opportunity here to, to secure some uh, some additional support for uh, for the research enterprise uh, in response to this, uh, this current crisis. Uh, okay, so that's the current fiscal year. Uh, looking down the road a little bit uh, to 2021 appropriations. So what uh, what is typically supposed to happen in a normal budget process is that the White House releases its budget uh, in February, and then Congress starts uh, uh, knocking out spending bills, say in late April. Uh, or May, and they operate on uh, on the, and they vote on those spending bills throughout the spring and summer. Um, and if things are operating as they should, they get everything finished by October first. Now they haven't actually gotten spending on time in over twenty years, uh, so you know keep that in mind. But that's how it's supposed to work. Um, now this year, the White House did get its budget out uh, uh, roughly on time in early February. Um, that budget once again makes pretty steep reductions, cuts billions out of the federal research budget. It's also mostly dead, as uh, as every uh, science budget to come out of, out of this White House uh, has been for the past few years. Um, you know, it's important to remember that Congress has the power of the purse, right? So the White House can propose budgets, make recommendations, uh, issue budget requests, um, but it's up to Congress to actually make spending decisions. And um, and so because of that, you know, that's a that's a constitutional role that the that uh, that the Congress fills. Uh, and so because of that. Um, you know, I think the way to, 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 to maybe to, I'd suggest to think about presidential science budgets. I mean, whenever a new a, a, a White House releases a new science budget, you know, whether it's President Trump or President Obama, um, it always gets a lot of, makes a lot of press, gets a lot of headlines, gets a lot of attention, and that's fine. It's, it's appropriate. It should. Um, but it's also important to remember basically that a lot of those top line numbers you see in presidential budgets, whether they're really good or really bad, they often don't end up mattering a whole lot. Right, Congress is going to do what it's going to do regarding, uh, you know, spending dollars, uh, you know, dollar levels and whatnot. Um, what I would argue matters a little bit more uh, in the president's budget are is the actual substance, right? So new new programs, new initiatives, uh, you know, changes to existing programs, new scientific opportunities that the agencies might want to pursue. Um, that's the kind of stuff that Congress tends to take more seriously. Uh, grapple with more meaningfully, uh, and often can pass into law. So things like you know the Brain Initiative at NIH, or the um, uh, the Energy Innovation Hubs at the Department of Energy, for example. Um, you know these are these are uh, uh, initiatives that that previous administration recommended and uh, that Congress uh, embraced. Um, the current White House, I've got some of their their uh, priorities for investment listed uh, here. Um, and again, these are in the context of declining research budgets overall, uh, but they have prioritized um, AI, quantum, uh, space exploration, critical infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and, um, uh, and these are all areas, or almost all areas, that Congress actually uh, has embraced in recent years, has invested in in recent years, uh, and is likely to continue investing in. The one, maybe, one exception might be space exploration. Um, the White House, uh, I think the price tag for um, uh, for their space exploration plans, I think, is about three and a half billion uh, in this year's budget. That's a lot of money, um, and there's a lot in Congress who, there are many in Congress who, you know, have some questions about whether that's that's really affordable or not. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, but otherwise, again, a lot of these these areas that you see listed here, um, you know, are probably areas that that Congress is going to have. Uh, uh, going to be able to find common ground with the White House. And of course, Congress has um, other priorities as well. 
Uh, in terms of timing, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we're, we're, we're probably looking at votes um, uh, end of this month or early July. In fact, just, uh, I believe it was this morning, uh, um, Nita Lowy, the chair of the House Appropriations Committee said they're actually gonna start their votes uh, the week of July 6th, so right after the July 4th holiday. So, uh, and they're gonna be voting in July and it sounds like it's gonna be an incredibly busy month. Um, but again, we're not, it's gonna be a longer process and appropriations probably finish up, you know, hopefully December, That's, I mean, that might be the optimistic scenario, uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, one of the big issues this year is that there is limited room under the spending caps. And I think some of you may be familiar with this, uh, you know, with this topic. Uh, these caps have been in place for almost a decade, and um, Congress is making some changes on what's counted towards the caps. Uh, uh, if they make the changes that I think they're going to make, it looks like we're going to have a year-over-year -year increase in the spending caps of about 2.5%, roughly, give or take. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not a lot of room. Um, it suggests a, a tight year. Um, it's a larger increase than it could have been. Um, but two and a half percent, you know, that kind of an increase, it's only about, it's a less than the, what, $20 billion increase or so. Um, so that's just, you know, not a lot of room. Congress is probably looking at some tough choices. Uh, so engaging uh, this year, especially, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is gonna be important. Um, you know, that two point, if you use that 2.5% increase as your, you know, your benchmark, uh, some agencies like NIH, you know, it's pretty popular, may well beat it. Um, other agencies might struggle to, to get to that 2.5% target, but, um, you know, but that is going to be a challenge. And again, you know, Congress and appropriators are looking at potentially some pretty tough choices um, in the budget this year. Um, now, that might sound like, you know, some cause for for uh, for pessimism, um, but I, I did want to point out that there are actually some reasons for optimism uh, in the science budget, um, and this may surprise many of you. But since President Trump uh, <laughs> since President Trump took office uh, in January 2017, and frankly, in spite of President Trump, uh, Congress has been pouring quite a bit of money into research uh, research appropriations uh, these past few years. So what you're looking at here, this is a uh, nominal uh, uh, dollar change in percentage terms uh, since January 2017, so covering FY16 uh, through FY2020, excuse me. Um, this also does not include the recent rounds of um, emergency spending for coronavirus. Uh, so this is all pre-coronavirus uh, pre uh, changes. And as I think you can see, there have actually been some, some pretty, you know, some pretty sizable um, funding increases for a lot of these agencies. Uh, DOE, uh, if you can read along the bottom, DOE is the Department of Energy. Uh, it's got their tech programs and their basic science programs. Uh, NIH, I'm sure everybody's familiar with. VA is Veterans Affairs. Uh, got Defense uh, and, and a few others here listed. But uh, again, not everybody has fared equally well. Um, but there have been some, some, some pretty big increases. Uh, uh, so it suggests that Congress, uh, you know, continues to support uh, the notion of, uh, of uh, federal research and federal research investments. Uh, and in fact, I mean, this is, you know, what's, I look at this, you know, this, this graph as someone who, you know, follows science budgets uh, pretty closely. And it's surprising to me how generous they've been. Um, you know, these are some pretty big numbers for, for some of these agencies. Um, but it's frankly not all that surprising that they have, uh, you know, increased spending and that they've kind of thumbed their nose uh, at the White House's uh, attempts to cut back on, on science funding. Um, you know, Congress actually has a pretty long and pretty bipartisan track record for supporting uh, federal research, especially um, uh, basic research. Um, and, and again, that, you know, may surprise some of you, but if you look at the data, uh, and you break it down, or that several of the basic science agencies especially have actually done pretty well for, for a long time. Um, and why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons, um, a lot of factors that can influence uh, science spending, science appropriations. Um, you're gonna hear a little bit later from, from my colleague, Sean, on, uh, on the, some of the things that, uh, that can influence a member's office, uh, uh, a member of Congress, but, um, but kind of in the, in the, I don't know, the bigger kind of more conceptual picture um, regarding why science has actually done fairly well in the long run, 
uh, in congressional appropriations. Uh, there's a couple of kind of big, you know, big, big motivators I might point to. Uh, and this will be the last, last slide I'll show you before I turn it over to, uh, to Toby to talk about universities. Uh, number one, probably the most important um, factor is the fact that all politics is local, right? This is probably something some of you have heard before. Uh, it's as true for science spending as it is for, you know, any other part of the budget, really. Um, and what it means simply is that uh, legislators come to Washington, they're, they're sent to Washington by their voters, by their states, by their districts, uh, to try to do right by their states and districts. Uh, and uh, on funding matters, uh, they often do. So it's not a coincidence that some of the biggest champions uh, of science uh, and innovation programs uh, in Congress, you know, maybe they have big universities in their districts or national labs uh, or federal agencies um, or, you know, high tech industry that may rely on some, uh, uh, some portion of the, uh, of the federal uh, research enterprise. Um, you know, so, so that's a, you know, a very real, um, very real influence, a very real fact when it comes to, to funding questions. Uh, and this can manifest in some interesting ways too. Um, you know, for example, you can have, uh, you know, very pro-science uh, legislators who may vote against certain, you know, big science projects because they don't feel that those projects uh, help the science community in their own states or districts. Um, you know, we saw that with the superconducting super collider, uh, 20, what, 20, over 25 years ago now, I guess. Um, you know, a lot of the voting patterns on whether to, to fund that, um, you know, that new particle collider or, uh, uh, you know, to fund it or defund it. Uh, a lot of the votes ran along uh, regional lines. Um, energy R&D is also a very, can be a very, very regional uh, topic uh, and funding area. Um, so, for example, it's not uncommon to see, you know, if you've got, let's say you've got a, you know, a fiscal hawk um, who's, you know, generally in favor of smaller government, opposes a lot of federal, you know, technology or applied, uh, applied research programs. Um, if that, you know, if he or she comes from a district that has a lot of, say, wind energy or a lot of fossil energy resources, um, you may see them uh, try to secure, you know, maybe through an amendment or something else, uh, try to secure extra funding for federal R&D programs uh, in those areas, even if generally they're not really in favor of uh, those kinds of programs, you know, in a, in a broader sense. Um, uh, and, you know, in addition, I'd also point out having kind of a, you know, one of the interesting um, uh, findings in the literature is that, uh, and this was actually from a study published in Science Magazine about a decade ago, I think, um, a, when, a, a, when a state or, uh, or district has a, uh, member of Congress on the Appropriations Subcommittee for NIH, uh, on average, they end up getting something like three or four percent more uh, from NIH uh, in, uh, in grant funding per year. So, I mean, there are some real tangible benefits to having uh, appropriators on the Appropriations Committees. Um, but this also matters for the authorizers. And I think, again, you're going to hear more from Sean about the difference between those two. Um, but, you know, no member of Congress is, uh, you know, is um, you know, is, uh, you know, it, this, this idea of geographic importance applies to, to everybody. Um, so that's one factor. The other one is public interest. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it's often easy to get, to, to be a little cynical sometimes. Um, but one of the big motivating factors for many champions of research funding in the Congress is public interest. Um, Congress has a longstanding uh, interest, for one, in public health. Um, NIH has done really well. Uh, in fact, NIH, since about 1980, NIH has uh, roughly doubled its share of the discretionary budget. Uh, and that, again, is an indicator of uh, long-term congressional support for, for medical research. Certainly, that's even more important now uh, in this era. Uh, in addition, national security has uh, for a long time been a, one of the drivers um, underlying uh, support for research. Uh, and increasingly lately, um, Competitiveness is a, uh, you know, has been a big topic. It's not uncommon to see appropriators put explicit language calling out, uh, you know, the competitive threat from China in their appropriations reports, um, you know, as they, uh, you know, seek to plus up an NSF, let's say. Um, so, you know, and so th these are issues that uh, legislators do take seriously. Um, you know, so if a legislator can help their district and help the broader, uh, you know, the nation, of course, that's kind of a win-win. 
The one thing I'll say, I've got a phrase here, appropriate role. And that's an important one to kind of keep in mind. Um, one of the big cleavages in um, federal research debates is over what is the appropriate role of government, right? Um, there's a lot of conflict over, often a lot of conflict over, well, I mentioned earlier, applied technology programs, um, you know, you know, fiscal conservatives often argue that programs that focus too much on technology are treading on ground better left to industry. Um, and whereas, you know, Democrats tend to, to, to feel differently. Um, when it comes to basic science, there's actually a lot more agreement. And again, this may surprise some of you, but there isn't a huge amount of, um, you know, space between the parties uh, when it comes to, to fundamental science. Um, everybody kind of sees those as important, uh, uh, both, both as appropriate, an, an appropriate thing for government to do. Um, and there's also a lot of folks who recognize the value that, that, that basic science uh, brings. So that's just, that's just sort of a, a bit, of, bit of situational awareness um, that may be helpful uh, as you think about uh, science spending. But again, you know, take these two factors, all politics is local, uh, as well as uh, public interest. Uh, add those to the fact that appropriators just like spending on stuff anyway. And that explains, I think, a lot of the success uh, in the long term that, that, that um, uh, research funding has had uh, in the context of a uh, what has not always been an easy uh, budget environment. So uh, I'm going to wrap up there, turn it over to Toby, uh, who's going to tell you about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on universities. Uh, but I did want to say quickly, um, my... Uh, uh, my info is here. Uh, check out our website, the Budget Program's website, triplas.org slash RD. We have a lot of information there. Um, historical data, interactive dashboards, analyses, things like that. Uh, so my Twitter handle is there. I'm, I'm uh, fairly active, so you can uh, tweet at me uh, if you must. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Toby. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Uh, let me see if I can get my slides up here. Okay, can people see them? They should be there. And let me get get go to slideshow. Okay, um, so I'm pleased to be with you to talk today about what we are seeing on university campuses in terms of the impacts of the pandemic. And then I want to relate those to maybe some broader historical information about science policy and, and then what, what policy issues are really at the fore right now that we are working on uh, related both to university uh, research policies as well as as uh, overall uh, science policy. So, um, when I normally give this talk, I start by talking about what science policy is. I'm going to spend a lot less time on that today because I want to get into the real issues we are facing and then what policies we feel we need to help us address the challenges. But, you know, let's, so, so I, I do want to re remind people that science policy really is, are the rules and regulations, practices, the guidelines that, under which scientific research is conducted, not to be confused with uh, science or policy, which means that science has lots of other impacts and, and affects other policies. And right now we're seeing that uh, because it is scientific information that is driving many of the public health decisions that are being made. And so it is important to note that that is health policy for which science plays an important role. So I just wanna distinguish the two, but there's often, you know, there's an interaction between them and you need to recognize that. Now the other thing, if you heard my longer talk on this before, you know that I'm a big believer that it's important to understand the history. Where have we been in the past? Harry Truman once said, there's nothing new in the world except the except the history you don't know. And so as we look at science's role today, it is worth going back in history and looking at science's role historically. So I like to go back to a time, I actually like to go back before World War II, a time when the federal government didn't support a lot of research. Uh, our, our, the universities I represent at the Association of American Universities didn't want uh, federal funding to come from uh, the federal government. They were worried that if they took federal funding, the federal government might tell them what they would have to invest in. So uh, there were a few exceptions. Uh, of course, during the Civil War, we created the Land Grant College, Act, the Land Grant Act, 
uh, the Morrill Act, and that created land grant colleges, and they had a public responsibility to get agriculture research out into local communities. And so the federal government funded agriculture research, it funded some aeronautics research. But um, up until, you know, after, through the depression, uh, you know, a lot of the money for universities came from big philanthropic uh, moguls, uh, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's, the Mellon's, they're the ones who supported research. Now that started to change after the depression, money started to dry up and along came World War II. Um, and a guy named Vannevar Bush, and he is pictured there. Vannevar Bush was a conservative engineer from MIT. He was recruited by Franklin uh, Roosevelt during World War II to come and help lead the science efforts for the Department of Defense uh, during the war. He believed strongly in the importance and value of, of, of science and the role that scientists could play in helping with the war effort, so much so that he really convinced universities to start uh, taking federal money and, and actually doing research uh, for the federal government. He also believed that it was important to keep scientists at their universities, not to bring them all uh, to national laboratories, but, uh, but that scientists working at universities al also help train the next generation. Um, and so Bush, as the unofficial science advisor for FDR during the war and overseeing the Department of Defense science efforts, led a lot of things. So he was in charge of the, the work on the Manhattan Project and, and the atomic bomb, which of course was one of the uh, major factors in, in, in actually ending the war. Uh, but there are other things, health advances, uh, blood substitutes and, and the like, and, um, and, and advances in radar, advances in precision, uh, um, pers precision guided bombs. All those things were so valuable to the war effort that as the war wound down, Franklin Roosevelt asked Bush to think about what could we do uh, to extend the value of science in the peacetime. And, and so Bush um, in 1945 submitted a report to then Harry Truman, who uh, of course Bush uh, 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 FDR had passed away by that point. Um, but this was a report that, that FDR had asked for. And it talked about, and, and Bush believed that science should and had to play a role in solving other societal issues related to health, related to de not uh, defense and economic well-being. And so Endless Frontier really was the basis for the creation of the National Science Foundation. There are a lot of debates that occurred in the five years it took to pass the bill that created the NSF. Issues about um, how do you distribute funding for science um, where Bush believed it was based upon the best science, but other folks in, in Congress believed that maybe you should block grant and give it to each, a, a little bit of science money to each state. Bush won that debate. It's why we have the peer review system we do. But the history is really important because Endless Frontier really said that science could help solve national problems and, and created the NSF uh, and, and really has been the basis for our science policy going forward. So I want to leave you with that thought. I'll come back to it at the end. Now, let me get into talking about what we're seeing in terms of current challenges on our university campuses as it relates to um, uh, COVID-19. And then I'm going to talk about how we're trying to address that through real actions and promote policies that help us address these challenges. So the first thing I just want you to know that is an as I talk to our university presidents, our vice presidents for research, and all our administrators, at the top of their, um, you know, driving everything is trying to ensure public health and safety. That means the safety of our students, the safety of our faculty, and remembering that our universities not only, they're not islands unto themselves, they reside in communities. And when it comes to COVID-19, if we bring back uh, you know, 50,000 students onto a campus, that can have an impact on the community. It, you know, who runs the hospitals? Does the university run the hospital or are they community hospitals? And if you have a spike and you have a number of cases, that can flood and overwhelm the community and you can have an outbreak. And so we are very cognizant of that. Um, when it comes to research, one of the most important things that, so, so um, back around March, you know, uh, basically a lot of classes went online and a lot of research programs were, were halted. 
and only essential research was continued. Um, now, a lot of research could be done from you know, faculty at home. They tried to do that, and graduate students, and, and many were successful. Some campuses fully shut down research operations except for non-essential research, much of that being COVID-19 related research. But one of the issues that we immediately faced was if we are not, if there's a slowdown in research grants, how do you pay people off those research grants when they're not able to do the, the research that, they're, that the, the grants have for them? And it's an ongoing issue, but immediately we got some regulatory flexibility that allowed grad students, postdocs, and researchers to be paid off in advance, even though the research was slowed. I'll talk more about one of the challenges with that, though, that we're now facing because the research is now restarting and uh, we'll have to figure out how to pay people to continue to do the research, but the budgets that were allowed in grants may not be enough to do that. So there were costs, by the way, when we, when we stopped research and ramping it down. Uh, there were a lot of issues. If you were dealing with animals, there were issues in, in, in dealing with that. There were environmental issues, depending on what your research involved. But now we're talking about the cost involved in ramping research up, as research is the first thing that our universities are really starting after having uh, closed many campuses. Um, we have a lot of core facilities that support research off of grants, uh, nano fabrication laboratories, 3D printing laboratories, clean rooms, animal research facilities, and often those are paid for off of fees off of grants. The work there has been stopped because the work on the grants wasn't happen, happening. One of, the, one of the big challenges in getting research going again is paying to get, that, to, to get those core facilities back up and running. A lot of our laboratories, by the way, donated their PPE to, to local hospitals, first responders, and medical and, and their medical centers because they were in desperate need. Now, as we start to ramp up research again, we need that PPE, but we don't have it. It was paid for off of federal grants. The issue is how do you buy it again and where do you find it even these days? So that's another challenge that we've got. Support for COVID-19 research. This is something where there has been funding, and I think uh, uh, that is the research that has continued. And we've seen huge amounts of innovation on our campuses, not only as it relates to new drugs and treatments, but also um, uh, other, other advances like respirators and things like that that, that have been needed, um, and, and even a lot of work uh, to develop and pro provide PPE to um, first responders. Then the, the thing that we're dealing with now is how that research that was stopped, how do we get it back online? How do we help people who may need to go travel or do field work? And how do we get the research back going again? The last thing I don't want to underestimate because I've kind of outlined the things as, as research administrators I talk to about with vice presidents for research, but there's a personal impact that we've seen on scientists and engineers that as they've had to go home, and spend time, and there's a very good uh, preprint paper that just came out that was a initial survey results, um, and I've got it there on the screen. I encourage you to look at that. And we have some colleagues who are senior fellows for AAU, Peter Schiffer and, and Jay Walsh, who've gotten involved in this uh, big study that's being done, and they are now doing a much larger study than what's summarized there. But one of the things they're finding is there are real adverse impacts, particularly for women because of the childcare responsibilities, they end up shouldering perhaps more than men. And that's, good, that's having an impact on their productivity. I think we absolutely need to understand the impact that this pandemic is having not only on our institutions, but also on the people who conduct science and the students. And, and that gets not only to things caused because you're working at home, but other stresses uh, that, that, that scientists and students have um, that are dealing with right now. And I, I just, I loved this quote when it came out uh, from a, it was a tweet from a researcher, um, Rodri Lewis, who just pointed out that Isaac Newton had been tremendously productive during the, the plague of 1965, 1665, but he didn't have childcare issues. So real quickly, just to talk a little bit about um, some of the policy issues that then flow from those campus-based issues that I raised. The first is we need money to help cover the costs of continuing to pay salaries when in fact the salary money that was 
devoted in a grant is now used up. We need money to repay and buy back that PPE. This is one of the reasons, and we'll talk about it later, that, that universities and uh, scientific associations and societies have been pushing for a research relief package in Congress, and we've asked for $26 billion in emergency funding. We need regulatory flexibility. So the, the, the fact that the OMB came out with a memo back in March that allowed PPE to be used and given away to first responders and allowed people to be continued to be paid off of the research grants, even though they might not be able to perform the research at that time, that was critical. That memo and that flexibility uh, goes away as of June 6th, 17th. We are desperately pushing for OMB to extend that regulatory flexibility. Immigration and international students, many international students went home um, and, and cannot now get back. And those we are trying to bring in as new students can't get interviews to get their visas approved because there are no in-person interviews and there's no way for them to get a visa interview right now. We have other concerns uh, about threats to the, um, to the uh, optional personal uh, practical training program, which has allowed uh, students who graduate here from foreign countries to stay and do work for a year. And that's, that program is under threat. And we've seen other concerns about uh, whether certain students from certain countries are no longer to be welcome. And most recently, we had a presidential proclamation came out last week that really struck at whether we were going to allow Chinese students with certain backgrounds in the country. So we're concerned, very concerned about those issues. Liability. If we do bring students back, what liability issues are we facing if people get sick um, from COVID-19? And how do we protect ourselves? There are a lot of education and teaching issues. Let's face it, our universities went online and most faculty who had to move their courses online had never taught an online course in their life. And so this raises a question of what are we gonna do to improve and ensure the quality of the education we provide if we have to stay online in the fall? And I think we're looking at some kind of a hybrid uh, likely um, courses that are both offer students the option to be in class or take those classes online. And then there are faculty safety issues and concerns as well as students. What if you have a pre-existing condition and your advisor, if you're a student and you have a, you have a pre-existing condition or you have, live at home with a family member and they have a pre-existing condition, what you, there are laws that protect your privacy. You don't have to say why you can't go back, but we need to make sure that faculty and our administrators are respecting those, those concerns because they will be real. Um, and one of the things that is a big issue, we just had a big webinar with all our presidents, is how we test, can campuses actually test, trace, and isolate students or faculty in ways that help us if we do have issues uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. So those are some of the policy issues. Uh, I wanna conclude here with why right now I think First of all, I, I think it's wonderful that we have so many people listening in today. But it is also more important now than ever that people be involved in advocacy and engaging in policy. And I want to go through why that is important. The first thing, I just summarized some reasons. We need regulatory flexibility. We need research relief. We need these dollars to continue to support research. Otherwise, we will not be able to fund and agencies will be placed in a tough position whether they fund the research that was that needs to be continued and finished, or they fund new grant programs. There's, as, as you know, even though science has done really well, there are gonna be a lot of fiscal challenges right now facing states, facing the country, and the federal government's gonna be have to deal with that. And the question is, where does science come out in terms of those priorities when we get to the regular pro appropriations? It's also important though to note we need people to thank Congress because they have been generous to science. They have given funding already in relief um, to, um, to some extent to universities. And um, while we really need more, it is important to recognize what has been done the last few years to support science. There's always gonna be questions. Are we spending the money that we've given you well? Is it, most, is it best being utilized? And we need to be able to respond effectively and say why past investments in science have paid off. Of course, I don't normally talk about the makeup of Congress. Let's face it, very few come from scientific backgrounds. We need scientists to inform them how science works 
we need graduate students. Remember, many of them, uh, I think it's 214 members got law degrees. They never worked off a research grant. They don't know that the, the vision of Andrew Bush was that we were going to fund not only research, but we were going to fund education by funding research that when we fund a research grant, it does double duty. It funds not only the research done by those principal investigators who get the grant, it also funds the education of the future generation of scientists, the graduate students, and the postdocs who work on that grant. And that needs to be explained because many members of Congress are still paying off their law school loans um, or, or their loans, um, and they never got a, never were funded off a research grant. We want to prevent laws, regulations that make it hard for scientists to do their work. We want to prevent new requirements that inhibit and harm our ability to do what we what has been a hallmark and one of the reasons we're such a great scientific power in the world and that is we have been able to attract because of that vision that Bush laid out the best and brightest students to come here because they want to work with the best scientists in the world. If they get a chance to do that. If we have immigration policies that discourage them from coming, I worry about our future and our ability to support the scientific enterprise. We want to help giant, we want to help shape policies based upon facts, based upon science, and particularly as it relates to what we do with public health, we want science to be involved. And that's why people like Tony Fauci and the role they are playing is so critical as we deal with this pandemic, that they are getting out real facts, not alternative facts. And the last thing I just want to say, at the end of the day, just like science came to help us win the war in World War II and was critical at other key junctures in our history. It's going to be the thing that helps us get out of this and saw and, and meet the challenges of the pandemic. I don't know if you've seen it, there's a, there's a great Pfizer ad that's running that says science will win. And if you haven't seen it, it's worth looking up on YouTube. I think they did an excellent job, but Stephen Hawking once said science will win because it works. And we need people to advocate for science, who know how science works, who are involved in science, who can make that case. And that's why it's really important that you're here and participating. So with that, my contact information is there and I'm gonna turn things, uh, turn things back over. Thank you so much, Toby. Uh, we've been getting a lot of great questions. And one was about, the, uh, about whether we would make the slides available, which we will. Um, and so we will we'll follow up with you all with with uh, where to uh, get copies of the of our presentations. We'll probably be on the AAAS website. So um, thanks again. Um, so now we're going to kind of shift gears. You've gotten a lot of background information with respect to uh, the budget, uh, the impacts of the budget, um, and the outlook as well as the impacts of COVID on the research enterprise and the outlook for that. Now we're going to start sh shifting gears into giving you a little bit more of a sneak peek into how Congress is structured and uh, leading into different ways that you can communicate and the important voice that you all have in that regard. And so I'm going to turn this now over to my colleague, Sean Gallagher. Sean? Thanks, Joanne. I'll go ahead and... Okay. So just by way of background, uh, well, first, thanks everybody for joining us today. We were really happy that we were able to do this. Um, by a, a quick way of background, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of practical ways that you communicate with Congress, and especially during a time like this. So my background is I used to work on Capitol Hill for about eight years. I worked for five different members of Congress spanning the country, and then I have had the privilege of working at AAAS for a little over five years. So advocating science, communicating science, uh, science for policy and policy for science. And so we'll get into the ins and outs, but this is more of a practical approach of what it's like to communicate with Congress, how they operate the way they do, why they operate the way they do, uh, and how you can intersect with them. So I usually always start off with thinking about what influences members of Congress. You know, I've worked for five uh, in their congressional offices. I was always on the House representative side, but I'd also worked on some campaigns. Uh, going around the district and, and meeting people and answering questions. Uh, and I like to give this kind of three main factors so that you can, as a constituent or as a citizen and a science advocate, understand what makes them tick and therefore be a better advocate. Because as we'll get to, there are going to be two components I give you to, be, to really be a, an effective science communicator. So unsurprisingly, during this time, 
the number one thing that really influences a member of Congress uh, are the media and current events. Um, and that is mainly just because that's what influences all of us. Uh, Congress as an institution is an incredibly reactive institution. It is not so much a forward thinking one, and that's by virtue of how we were set up. Um, and so the media and the current events, uh, as everybody that's sitting here you know, in this webinar rightly knows, drives a lot of what we do. So um, the reason I'm talking to you on Zoom is because of COVID. Uh, and that, of course, has disrupted everything, and that's what was the conversation until just last week. Um, and I will say to you, uh, for those, you know, that are kind of feeling sad and in despair, you know, I, I was in Congress during uh, the 2007-2008 financial crisis, and we got through that one. I lived through healthcare reform, um, through the troop surges in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are a lot of things that Congress in this country has dealt with. Um, it can seem very bad during the time, but eventually people prevail and we get through. I'm trying to send a, a more hopeful message in kind of like these disparaging times. But, you know, I, wanna, I wanted to put that out. Um, this is a really, really simple way to understand why sometimes if you're looking at Congress to understand what it is that they're doing. Um, and this is large and small. So one of the last members of Congress I worked for was Rush Holt. He was the former CEO of AAAS and he was a congressman from New Jersey. Uh, so just to give you a very benign, small example, uh, Chris Christie, when he was governor of New Jersey, there's that thing about Bridgegate and, and traffic problems. And for the two months that that was a story, I think it was a very long time, that dominated everything that Rush ever did because he couldn't do anything without the media asking him about that controversy. And he hated it. He, he wanted to talk about other things. But the current events really drives how members do what they do about what constituents are asking them. And so it's very important to understand kind of what makes them tick, why are they doing the things that they're doing, and it's very reactionary. The second thing I like to always tell folks that influence members of Congress, and again, is an underpinning of maybe why they are acting the way that they're acting, is their values uh, and personal convictions. And, and a simple way I like to kind of demonstrate this is that folks forget when people are in Congress, they had to run for Congress. And when you run for Congress, you quickly realize um, as any member, any candidate has ever done, that Congress literally deals with everything. It deals with potholes and stop signs and funding for transportation to troop levels in, in wars, to a pandemic response, to climate change, to funding health agencies, to controversial issues like abortion and religious rights and all of this stuff. You start to understand as a candidate, and you see most members do this, they start to bifurcate. They start to say, okay, how, how do I compartmentalize my answers into values or in, into like a portal that makes sense for me? Um, and you see members do this. They start to say, okay, well, I might not know the specifics of the question you're answering and, and I don't have a specific answer, but my values tend to say A or B. You know, Toby and Matt both touched on a lot of this harkens back to what people feel are the appropriate role of the federal government whether they believe that the federal government should or should not take action. And that steers a lot of times the way members of Congress, senators and members of the House deal with things, the, the answers they put forth and the solutions that they offer. Uh, and so this is just, again, another portal or prism or a way of looking at it that can help you as a science advocate understand why Congress is doing what it's doing. And the third is the district. Uh, Matt and Toby both alluded to this, all politics is local. It really is true. Uh, particularly if you're talking to a member of the House. Um, there are 435 of them, uh, and they're all very desperate to prove to you that they are doing their jobs to the betterment, uh, to the benefit of their district. They always try and tie everything that they do, whether it's a stimulus bill or education funding or science funding, you know, the list goes on and on. They will typically always tie it back to, well, how does this affect my district? How does the person on, you know, Autumn Tree Drive in Fort Wayne, Indiana, understand that this is why I'm doing this and they're trying to, let's see. And so these are the three things. I know that this is rather simplistic in a sense, but this, this really compartmentalizes if you wanna say, okay, well, if I wanna communicate with Congress and I wanna make an impact and I wanna be an effective advocate, you first have to understand why they operate the way that they do. And these three things kind of give you that perspective. And so, this is my just two simple rules rubric. Um, and we use this at AAAS all the time in what we do. 
two effective ways to communicate with policy factor, with policymakers, and it's knowing your audience and telling your story. Knowing your audience can be rephrased as to doing your homework. Um, who are you talking to? Uh, where do they sit in the House of Representatives? What's their history, their background, their profile? What values have they put out to date that shape their worldview and their vision? Um, and also, if you're going in and talking to a staff member, how old are they? How old are they? What's their background? What research did you do that enables you to meet somebody where they are and that you know kind of like the context of the way they're thinking so that if you're taking a complex and technical issue uh, you know, on a scientific basis, or maybe even a simple one, like, um, you know, health funding or something like that, that if you know where they are, you know, what committees that they're on, um, you know, their background, the actions they've taken before, that will help you and enable you to be a much more effective advocate. Again, it's all akin to doing your homework. And the second one, and I can't stress this enough, is telling your story. Um, every single member of Congress that I've worked for, every single member of Congress I watch on TV, um, everybody is in the storytelling business. And it's mainly because this is how we communicate as human beings. Uh, one of the challenges of the scientific community is that we're very data-driven and evidence-driven. And that is a very, very, very good thing. Uh, you know, Rush Holt, the, my former boss, used to say that the scientific process is basically removing bias uh, from our understanding of the world. Now, how do you communicate that properly? Uh, you tell a story. Uh, instead of just quoting facts and figures, you contextualize it, you make it relevant, you make it uh, important to the person that you're talking to. And again, it's weaving your ask or your purpose or your message into a compelling narrative. And if you watch any member of Congress give a floor speech, um, give a stump speech on a campaign, this is how they communicate. They tell a story, they weave it back to, you know, Bob and Mary from my district, you know, I voted on this bill and they tell this arc. This is their story arc about this is why it's important. This is why I did it. And so it's memorable. Uh, and Aaron's actually uh, after me gonna talk about making your, your messages memorable. But this is again, this the two effective ways to communicate with policymakers. I usually give this as a quick and skinny, um, knowing your audience, telling your story. So this is just also setting the context of a lot of people ask like, why does Congress operate the way that it does? So now we've gone the context of how to be an effective, you know, what, what makes them tick this is the purpose of Congress in a nutshell. It's to pass laws and it's to fund stuff. And it rarely passes laws because in order to pass the laws, you got to convince a lot of people that your idea is good. Uh, and a lot of people who probably don't think like you. So the main purpose, particularly in the house, and they realize this, this is their sacred duty, is the power of the purse, is to fund things. And so on the Hill, and when you go in and you talk to people, it's very, very important to understand that there is a difference between members of Congress who write the checks and members of Congress who cash the checks. And this inherently is the difference between authorization and appropriation. So when Matt talked about the budget and Toby alluded to this too, and people often, the science advocate world comes to us and says, oh, you know, I met with the science committee and they have these grand ideas about what they wanna do. How come it didn't manifest? How come it didn't come to pass? And the reason being is that the authorizers in Congress, the people who write the checks, they're usually ones that paint the, the future or a vision of what they want in any particular agency, NIH, um, you know, Department of Justice, Department of Energy, whatever you, whatever you, you know, think. The people on the Appropriations Committee are actually a little bit more important because while they can't do anything new, they can't write a new map, that's not their job, they're the ones that actually fund projects or ideas. So again, authorization writes the checks, appropriations cashes it. This is important, again, about knowing your audience. Uh, if you're going to someone who's an appropriator, you're gonna know that they're the ones that ultimately make the decision about where dollars go. And so you have to look at that when you go to, to Congress. This is a breakdown of all the committees, and you can see up here, this is just a, a screen grab from a, a web page. Um, this is house.gov slash committees. This will show you all the committees in Congress. This is just the House. Um, but here you can see that there's a whole bunch of authorizing committees, and then there's just the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee is primarily the most important one in the House. This is an example of what it looks like in the Senate side for an authorizing committee. You see that it's broken down into what jurisdiction certain committees have to do what. 
So if you're on the science spaces competitive committee, you see that your jurisdiction, your responsibilities are over NSF, NASA, NIST, and OSTP. They write again the blueprint of what they think should be funded. And then it goes to an appropriations committee to that appropriator to then fund it. Um, it's just a, a simple kind of civics understanding about how science interplays and, and why people get money in the way that they do. So this is just really quick. Aaron's gonna go over a lot of this too in the next presentation, but this is just a, a something that, that's pretty straightforward and simple, knowing your audience again about the context of where people are. You know, Joanne, Aaron, Matt, Toby, uh, and I, we're communicating with Congress on a weekly basis now. Um, the context is obviously very present uh, about how they're operating, COVID dominating everything, and now, uh, you know, the, the George Floyd death dominating the media and the, and the congressional cycle as we speak. It's just being respectful when you go in to know that staff and members, that's what they're dealing with on a daily basis. I mean, I can only imagine I was there during the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and that's all we dealt with from the 8.30 a.m. staff meetings all the way to the 6 p.m. staff meetings and everything in between. It was trying to figure out what credit default swaps are and, and mortgages. That shifts, and now everything is COVID and everything is is the current state of affairs. And so it's, it, if you want to communicate science, if you want to communicate what's important to you, just be respectful and understanding kind of the lives and the context of which staff and members of Congress on Capitol Hill are dealing with it. Um, and here's a quick do's and don'ts. Again, these, these slides will be available to you at the end and this, this entire presentation is being recorded. But these are just a quick and skinny and, and my colleague uh, Aaron's gonna give you a fantastic overview of, of what to do when you're, when you're in there uh, communicating with Congress. But my time is, is pretty much running up. Uh, I just wanted to go over that quick and skinny about, again, knowing your audience, telling your story, what the context of Congress is right now um, and pretty much just telling you guys, keep up the good work. Um, it's just like Toby said, it is more important than ever now to have the people doing the science, communicating the importance of their work um, to help shape the future of the country. I think now more than ever, people are realizing just the fundamental importance of how scientists and the research institutions, what they play in our society. Uh, how they shape our future and how they protect us from things like infectious diseases. And so um, all of us are very proud to work at AAAS and I'm, I'm very, very happy that we're able to do this and, uh, you know, keep up the good work. We're here for you and um, stay healthy and stay sane. Uh, and uh, with that, I will turn it over to Aaron. Thanks so much, Sean. I will go ahead and share my slides now. Okay, all good. Hi everyone, I'm Erin Heath. I am with the AAAS Office of Government Relations. I'm excited to be here today. Now my standard presentation, I talk a little bit about why you should care about communicating your science to policymakers. And I talk a little bit about how you should communicate, but mostly I offer practical tips on how to engage in policy with whatever amount of time you have, if you have an hour, if you have a day, a week, a year. How this is different is I'm going to focus on how to engage in policy specifically during the time of COVID-19. Going to start with our famous inverted triangle slide. And we've been showing this, a version of this slide for years in our communications and policy trainings. And what this illustrates in a really nice way is how the cultures of communicating are different in the science world and in the policy world. And in fact, they're, they're polar opposites. So you can see here, scientists, you know, we're used to spending years uh, doing the background research, digging into the supporting details, and then uh, at the end of all of that, coming out with our results or our conclusions. Well, policymakers want the results first. They want to hear the bottom line, and then they want to know why they should care. So before you can even talk about the details of your research, you need to be able to tell them what the bottom line is and why they should care. So it's a different style of communication. So I'll say all of the advice you normally will hear about communicating your science, for example, avoiding jargon. Of course, this still holds true during a pandemic and you can find myriad tips on this if you visit the AAAS online communication toolkit, which I can post the link to in the chat. 
So that's all I'll say about that for now, but I do want to spend a little time on how you should think about com communicating during COVID-19. So when we teach science communication workshops, one of the things we suggest is coming up with three key points. Key points that serve as a foundation for what you want to say and guide your message. So when I thought about what I wanted to say about communicating your science now, I came up with three C's. Context, coordination, and courtesy. So context. First, understand the big picture. What are the major issues of the day, right? So COVID-19 continues to be a major issue. This is the reality, and there's so much wrapped up into that testing, treatment, response. Certainly our minds are on impacts to scientific research itself, as Toby discussed. Remember that concern operates, operates within the larger context. So keep that in mind. Also critical right now, as ever, are the broader economy and jobs. Science isn't the only sector, nor are science policy issues the only issues. Um, second, understand what's going on in the district. So your argument's going to be far stronger and more resonant if you connect it to what's going on back home. This is, this is always true. So for example, how is your lab or your university or your organization affected uh, in the policymaker's own district? Or is, is there research on COVID-19 going on in the district that they should know more about? My third point here is have a sense of what can be done. Uh, in other words, the ask. And we'll talk about this later on in the webinar. Beyond providing information about the impacts of COVID on scientific research, which is valuable in itself, is there something you can ask a policymaker to do about it? So maybe it's sponsoring or co-sponsoring or voting for a bill. Maybe it's holding a hearing or asking a question in a hearing, or maybe it's speaking publicly or writing about it. Coordination, what are other organizations doing about this? So your COVID-19 message is stronger as part of a larger unified effort. So how should you coordinate? Well, number one, get in touch with your university government relations office. They are great resources on both issues and opportunities to engage. And second, check in with your scientific society. Most major societies have science policy offices and or activities, and many are developing new ways to engage during COVID-19. Virtual advocacy, can you join an established virtual advocacy event? Again, scientific societies are great resources here. These offer trainings about both the issues and the how-tos. So a few examples here. The Society for Neuroscience has an effort going on right now called the Neuro Advocate Challenge, which is engaging in virtual adv advocacy activities all month long. And if you complete all of the activities, you can win a spot at their next in-person congressional visit day. The American Geophysical Union has a program called Voices for Science. This trains scientists to communicate their science and engage in policy. This program also pivoted to virtual advocacy activities this year. And finally, the Consortium of Social Science Associations, which has an annual congressional visit day. They, they took their event, which is normally held in March, to a virtual event in April. So advocacy does continue. Social media, this has taken on increasing importance over the past decade. We have data that shows the usage of social media by US members of Congress jumped dramatically over the span of just a few years. It's a good way to get your message out and get it in front of policymakers, especially now over social distancing, right? <clears throat> so one example here, NSF, the National Science Foundation, just celebrated its 70th anniversary and dozens of organizations and researchers and members of Congress helped highlight the amazing work that NSF does using hashtags like CNSF, NSF 70 and NSF stories. And finally, courtesy. Remember, policymakers are going through the same things you are, right? They have the same concerns about their health and the health of their loved ones. They're also adjusting to the sudden shift to working from home, and they're also worried about the future. Sean already talked about this, but uh, science is not entitled to funding, right? We have to make the case about why it's important. And this, of course, continues to be true now during the pandemic. And finally, all the usual rules of advocacy apply. Be polite, be on time, and listen to others' points of view. Now I'm going to talk about ways to engage in policy in a virtual world. Uh, and some of these are the same as I might say, say uh, in non-COVID times. Uh, but the first one is sign up for newsletters, right? This is a great way to learn about 
issues that you care about and opportunities to engage. So I'll mention a couple that you might want to consider. One is that we, AAAS, have a newsletter for our members. It's called the Policy Alert. So every Monday morning, it's the first thing a lot of us do. We get together, we talk about the news of the week, and then we write about it. So if you are a AAAS student member, you can opt into this newsletter again. It's called the Policy Alert. Uh, our journal, Science, capital S Science, also has a fantastic policy blog. It's called Science Insider. Uh, and finally, again, check in with your scientific society. A lot of them have great newsletters and other kind of online resources. Uh, next, learn something new with a webinar. Uh, I already felt like there were a lot of webinars before. And now, <laughs> now I feel like I can just spend all day every day on a webinar. So I, I know there's a lot of competition out there. <clears throat> I want to thank you for being on our webinar. Social media campaigns, you know, we talked about that a little bit. Here's a good, easy way to start. Um, follow all of us on Twitter, see what we're talking about, see who we follow, and go from there. Attend a virtual meeting of a government agency. So government agencies have advisory committees or boards that hold public meetings regularly. And they're still doing this, but virtually. So for example, the National Science Board, that's the policy board of NSF, just had its first full virtual meeting last month. And these are a great way to learn about what's going on at the federal research agencies. Virtual advocacy days, as I mentioned, these are opportunities to work with individuals who share your policy interests to advocate for science or grad education or whatever inspires you. And they involve some element of training and sometimes the organization will even schedule meetings with policymakers for you. But one example that's coming up in a few months, one that we at AAAS often participate in, is called the Rally for Medical Research. I believe they're still deciding whether to go virtual and I know they're planning for the possibility. Uh, public comments. So beyond Capitol Hill, federal research agencies are constantly asking scientists and other stakeholders for input through requests for information or requests for public comment. And these are featured on regulations.gov. But a better way, in my opinion, to watch for these opportunities is in science policy newsletters, like, again, like our policy alert. So even during COVID, work is still happening on a variety of science policy topics. For example, at least three institutes or centers at the National Institutes of Health are currently open for comment on their multi-year strategic plans. Next, connect, connect with organizations that have resources to share. And I'm going to flip to another slide here. I'm going to talk about some of these organizations that provide opportunities to engage or resources to help you engage the first one is one that's close to my heart. It's Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy Coalition, or ESEP for short. This is something that Toby and I co-chair. And it's a coalition of groups that are working together to help empower scientists and engineers to engage in policy at all levels of government. So we, if you go to our website, science-engage.org, we have a great resource portal there. We also have a long-running webinar series and uh, we also have networking events. So we have science policy happy hours. They started in Washington, DC, and now they're all over the country. Now on some of these efforts, now we're actually partnering with the next organization on my list, the National Science Policy Network. Now I know a lot of you know about this. I think uh, some of you are here because you saw it on SPN. So we're happy to be longtime partners with this group. If you don't know, it's a national network of student science policy and advocacy groups. And ESEP and NSPN are now working together on both webinars and on virtual networking events, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the next one, the one in green here, ESEL, Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally. It's an organization that was begun and, and is led by a former AAAS policy fellow. And this group is doing amazing, amazing work focused on local engagement. So I saw some of you asking about local engagement in the chat. Definitely look this one up. The newsletter alone is worth knowing about because you can read examples of scientists engaging in policy in their hometowns. The Federation of American Scientists, they've been doing a lot of interactive work, including an online Ask a Scientist initiative on COVID-19. <clears throat> uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists has a science network of more than 25,000 scientists and engineers focused on advocacy. And I will post links to all of these in the chat. Um, and then JSPG, I'll talk about it in a minute because it actually goes to my next bullet, which is right about an issue. So 
JSPG, the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. Full disclosure, I chair the governing board of this journal, and I'm so proud to do it because it's an excellent opportunity for grad students and postdocs and early career researchers to write about policy. So JSPG is an interdisciplinary peer-reviewed journal that focuses on science and tech policy, both domestic and international. Uh, virtual happy hours, I mentioned this a bit, ESAP and NSPN are partnering on on a couple of these, we've done two. And the next one, and they've been remarkably fun. Uh, the next one's actually coming up, it's on June 9th. So I hope you all can consider attending if you wanna come. I've got the details on top of my Twitter, public Heath, if you want details. Uh, and finally, register for uh, mail-in or absentee voting. Now, I don't need to tell you how important it is to vote. Uh, so get your ducks in a row and make sure you're set up to make your voice heard. So I wanted to just talk briefly about things that we are already seeing and hearing in this new virtual advocacy world. Um, and as I said, this is new for all of us. Many science organizations have had to cancel meetings at the last minute and or move in-person efforts to virtual efforts. Uh, so this uh, result, COVID resulted in a sudden experiment in virtual advocacy. So certainly it's not the way anyone would wanna make this switch, but the good news is Earlier reports suggest that these virtual advocacy efforts are succeeding in terms of phone calls with congressional offices are happening. Sometimes on video, sometimes not. Also participation is available to new people. So people who maybe wouldn't be able to travel to Washington DC are able to do now do federal advocacy events virtually. And um, we also think, we've talked about this a bit already, we also think there's real potential for engagement at, on the state and local level. Uh, State and, lawmaker, state and local lawmakers are in continual need for scientific expertise and advice. This hasn't changed. And federal lawmakers are spending more time in their district offices as well. So we have a few programs that operate on this level. And the one I want to flag is the Local Science Engagement Network. This is a program that we're piloting in Colorado, Mississippi, and Georgia. And I think the director of this program, Dan Berry, may be on hand to answer questions about this during the Q&A. And you'll hear more. Finally, uh, before I turn back to my colleagues, I wanna draw your attention to a relatively recent new resource developed by a team of scientists led by American University. I was part of that team. It's a booklet called Evidence-Based Communication with Policymakers. And uh, these are tips developed from our research on both lawmakers and scientific organizations. I recommend you check that out. It's at the link here. And this is me. I'm always happy to answer emails. I'm also on Twitter. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Erin. Okay, I'm now going to ask all of our panelists to turn their videos back on so everyone can see your bright and shiny faces. Thank you. This has been a great, great conversation and lots of great um, questions. Uh, we're going to talk a bit first though, I'm gonna share my screen, uh, just about, um, let's see if I can find it, there we go. Just about congressional visits specifically, and then we're gonna have you know, go into the ask us anything part. So Aaron's already kind of teed this up a bit um, about, and Sean, about how to approach having a, a, congressional, a congressional meeting, whether it's a personal office or a committee office. In some respect, it's not that much different. Um, it, it does take a lot more planning and practice uh, because some meetings are only by teleconference um, and, not by, um, uh, and not by Zoom. Um, and so you have to take that into consideration about the, um, the, the platform that you're able to have your meeting. Um, and uh, that also kind of plays into how you need to prepare for it because you don't, if it's a teleconference that you are having, you don't have the same visual cues that you would normally have during a face-to-face -face meeting. And so it takes a little bit more practice and because you wanna make sure that you are um, uh, keeping, you know, uh, keeping track of time and allowing um, the staffers to uh, interject and ask questions. 
So, but the basic process is kind of the same. Um, you're gonna set up a meeting with the scheduler uh, if you're reaching out to a personal office um, or, and you, we can go into some uh, advice about where to get that information um, and or you're going to reach out to a committee staff if you're meeting with a committee if you're meeting with committee staff it doesn't matter there there isn't you don't have to worry about whether you're part of the district or not because they represent their jurisdiction is covering like a range of uh, agencies or policy issues and so if you have a, a perspective on a specific agency like NSF or DOE, they're going to want to hear from you. It doesn't matter whether or not you're in that particular district or not. Um, you want to plan with your team, and this is where planning is really important uh, because you need to really, you need to prepare a, a script, especially if it is a teleconference. You need to not only develop what your, your ask is, but you need to assign your talking points, who's in what order you're going to go in, um, and have a note taker uh, with uh, to, to kind of make sure that someone is uh, gathering all of the um, all of the notes so that you can then as assign follow-ups and it's good to kind of include like pause points uh, where you might want to then stop and ask a staffer you know do you have a question but you also want to prepare your own questions what you want to ask them um, and then you also have to craft your ask um, you want to include, you know, think about your audience. Sean and, and Aaron kind of went into that. Think about the context. Uh, that was also covered. But you do want to include your personal story. That's really, really important. And then obviously you want to thank them and you want to follow up. Um, so I'm going to ask folks to maybe unmute. I'm going to um, turn this, go back to the Q&A um, so that I can see what some of the questions people might have with respect uh, to this. Okay, so does any, uh, first, do any of the speakers want to interject here uh, while I go through the Q&A portions here? Okay, so, so one of the questions that came up is, um, and at a number of times we've said that it's important to engage as Congress is making difficult budget decisions. And what does that mean? Um, Congress is, has a lot of budgetary challenges as Matt has outlined. Um, so when we say that it's important to engage, what do we mean by that? Um, I don't know, Toby, if you want to kind of chime in on that. Yeah, so part of it's knowing and it's really important that that knowing the timing of when decisions are going to be made and weighing in at the right moment. So when people are trying to affect appropriations and I'm sure Matt can speak to this, but I, I started my career on Capitol Hill. There is nothing more annoying than a person contacting me a week after a vote had occurred and asking my boss to vote a certain way. It didn't really work. Um, you really need to be in early and often and use, you know, build a relationship with the staff so you know when things are going on. But um, there's usually a, a rhythm. And, and right now, for example, we are in the throes of pushing the Senate, particularly on the research relief, because we know the House has passed the bill. So you don't want to go to the House at this point because they've already acted. But the Senate is where the action is at. And, and so on the research relief package, now is the time to be weighing in on that and get, contacting your senators and saying we, and, and frankly, what really helps for those of you who are graduate students is explaining why it matters to you personally. My association could go in and say, hey, we need all this money and they say, yeah, you know, of course you're pushing for money. But when you go in and say, this is, I, I'm going to lose my funding and I have a bunch of colleagues and we, we live in your, you know, we vote in your district and we need your help. Or your, or your state in this instance, if you're contacting centers, that makes a difference and you have to do it at the right time. So part of it's too, the other thing I'd say, and I think this has already kind of come up is, this is where being connected to scientific societies, they often send out alerts. They say, now's the time, right? Your congressman, we need to do this. Um, we also know that um, groups like the National Association of Graduate and Professional Students and um, Student Advocates for Graduate Education, SAGE, they often send out alerts and get people, uh, you know, notify them the right time to make those contacts. So I think that's what we're really talking about is, is you need to be timely, um, active, and know what to say, when to say it, and be direct in your comments. Okay, 
any other takers before I move on to another question on congressional meetings? There'll still be time for all the different questions later. We're just going to focus on the, on the meeting side. So another question uh, that's kind of more, uh, I'm going to do another funding question, then there'll be one on international students. Um, so since science funding tends to be regional, I mean, it is dispersed around the country, how can we advocate for funding when it's not directly beneficial to a specific representative, for example? Matt, do you want to take that it, one first? Yeah, I could just quickly take that. I mean, and the others, I hope, will jump in. But I mean, I think, Toby actually just said it, I think. Um, you know, it's obviously there, are, every district is facing lots of different issues. And, you know, there may be easy ways to tie your research directly back to some of those. Um, if your research is not really super relevant to immediate issues that are happening at home, uh, well, that means, I mean, the benefit of science funding maybe isn't, maybe it's not your district, maybe it's you, right? Maybe you are, <laughs> you are the constituent, you are the beneficiary. Um, and if nothing else, and we you know we've heard others have, 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 have mentioned this, right? I mean, telling your own story can be an important, uh, an important means to, 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 to make that connection with a Hill office. Um, you know, if your district happens to have a whole lot of, you know, I don't know, particular industry that benefits from, from science funding of some kind, and that's what you do, great. That's a, that could be a great story to tell. But if you don't need that kind of a, you know, broader socioeconomic connection to make a really good case for why your own legislator, right, your own member, um, you know, should be supporting uh, a, a program that you care about um, because of the fact that you are their constituent. Um, and, you know, maybe it's enough that, you know, you want to make a good contribution to society somehow, you know, uh, you know, I mean, talk about what you what it is you, you do and what it is you hope to achieve. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, that can help. Um, but then, you know, in addition, you know, as, as Joanne mentioned, I mean, there's, you've also do have, there's your own kind of home legislator's office, but there's also the authorizers, the, the, the committees, the uh, committee staff that, um, you know, are, are going to be more in tune with, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a broader set of issues that don't have that same geographic linkage. So, um, but that's what I say, right? If, if it doesn't benefit the district, well, you are the district. So. Right. Joanne, can I add one other? Sure. Go ahead, Toby. One is always remember too, that if you, if you grew up somewhere and you go to school and you get a grant, your, your parents benefited from the fact that you got funding Remember where you where you grew up? Because I grew up in a rural area. It's more conservative. Sometimes there are linkages back there. More importantly, though, remember that the outcomes of science are what matters. Every if we find a vaccine for coronavirus, every American citizen will benefit. It doesn't matter where it came from, uh, it, and and so we have to remind people of what what their constituents have gotten from science, whether it's agricultural advances that have, advanced, that have helped farmers or, or um, other things. We often, I, I show a graphic sometimes we talk, we used to go into a, a, a member from Pennsylvania who had run a car dealership, right? We showed him all the advances that had come from federally funded scientific research that were incorporated now into the modern, modern automobile from the tire treads on the wheels to to you know, the shatterproof windshields, which were really developed because of work done by national DOE laboratories. So I just think it's important to, to talk about the outputs of science and why we invest in this research in the first place. Right, and that also relates, we also got a, a question from someone that said, you know, I'm, I, I grew up in, in this state A, but I'm now in grad school in state B, does it make, can I still advocate in these two different localities? And I mean, Toby, you'll have your own perspective, but I mean, A, it depends on A, where you're voting, but, and, but B, I don't think it necessarily, you still can advocate in both places because you, you probably still have contacts and family members in, where, in the same district that you grew up in. And, and you may have personal connections, went to the same high school, uh, you know, grew up in the same, never knew the same people. You, there are different ways that you can connect with these um, members of Congress, regardless of whether you're in graduate school in a different, in a different state. But Toby, you, you, you probably were on the receiving end of that yourself. Well, I'd say one thing you can do, and it may not be, even if you don't vote there, um, you know, usually there are local papers and you can write op-eds and put those there because because you grew up there and people will relate and you can relate to what people care about there and relate the importance of the science back to the people, you know, the community in which you grew up. And again, 
I always think that having family members there and parents, it's worth talking to members. And um, oftentimes they're very proud of students who grew up there and now are, are studying science and doing very exciting things. So it's, it's worth um, trying to reach out and go back and, um, and make those connections. Um, okay, another uh, question is about what can we do to support our international student colleagues, many of whom are worrying about their status in the country, uh, getting back to the U.S. if they're left renewing visas, uh, applying for OPT, deportation, et cetera. Um, many professional societies are involved in this. AAAS is, has also spoken out and issued statements. There are organizations like NAFSA that have been, are very engaged. Uh, they don't represent just STEM international students. They represent all international students here in the United States. And Toby and I work very, very closely with them and they are, are strong advocates uh, for um, uh, advocating on behalf of international students. Um, we are definitely aware uh, of the concerns, uh, AAAS. Um, we actually launched uh, a project called Science Beyond Borders uh, to start collecting the stories of international students and the concerns that they have. Um, but that was before COVID and the dynamics are so different. So we have to revisit the, that website to kind of reconsider how we can gather appropriate information, uh, gather the data in an appropriate manner that is going to be helpful um, to decision makers. Uh, so um, let us please feel free to follow up uh, with me um, with respect to any, you know, the concerns that you have. Uh, but I'll open it up also to some of our other um, speakers, Toby, and if you want to add to that. I'm just going to say, I mentioned NAGPS and SAGE. I know they've started a social media campaign on things like OPT, which are big concerns, and uh, given the proclamation that came out. Um, so people may want to check um, their websites or, or um, tune into that, because they, uh, again, I think are very concerned about, about this um, set of issues. Thanks. Um, I'll do one more budget question and then there's um, another uh, 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 diversity related question that I think are important in terms of how we communicate with Congress. Um, so uh, for the budget question, and this is a classic, it's a, a really, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, we, we talk about this all the time. Is it unproductive to try to steer policymakers to think of benefits in the future, five to 10 years out? instead of the major issues of the day. Um, so I'm gonna throw it to open that up. That is a constant, constant question. Matt, um, Aaron, not, it's a golden goose opportunity there for you. So um, opening up the floor to our panelists. Sure, well you, you mentioned golden goose, so I will, uh, I will happily talk about that. Uh, this is an award that AAAS and AAU and a number of or other organizations started. And the purpose is to tell the stories of the unexpected impacts of science. And so this is a way for us to show sometimes the question is, well, what, what's, where is this science going? Uh, we don't always know, but sometimes it goes in amazing places. And so we wanted a way to tell those stories. And the idea actually came from a member of Congress, Jim Cooper from Tennessee. And so as I said, we started this award about nine years ago, and now we have a whole collection of these stories of the unexpected impacts of federally funded research. And uh, right now we're doing something completely different. We actually just uh, put out a, a call for nominations for COVID-19 success stories. So we just closed that. Uh, so I'm thinking we're going to have new and exciting stories to tell this year. So please stay tuned. And if you want to learn more, it's goldengooseaward.org. Anybody else? And I think that also answers uh, the, the question about fundamental research in which the outcomes uh, of our research may be years down the road. Um, so that, that golden goose is an example. You can look at those stories and you can actually even tie some of those stories to what's happening today. So one of the awardees, for example, uh, was Hudson Freeze, uh, um, where he and his colleague did research on uh, why, you know, why bacteriums are able to live in, in hot springs. 
and and that uh, that that Bacteria the Thermus aquaticus led to the development of PRC technology, which is now being used in, in COVID testing. So there are ways of kind of looking at these kind of odd sounding uh, fundamental research that might take years and might sit around for years uh, and can have major implications. So that's uh, important to remember. I'll just, I'll, I'll just say real quick too, it's, I, I forget, I don't know, I don't remember who said this, this is not original, but uh, I've heard science funding referred to as as uh, you know, one of the, the kind of most notable forms of faith-based policymaking uh, to the extent that you know, Congress does, you know, as had, uh, earlier, Congress does have a pretty long track record of funding lots of basic science that has um, you know, really uncertain payoffs potentially you know, years down the road. Um, you know, so I mean, it's, uh, I, so I think it absolutely, absolutely is you know, worth talking about societal benefits, even if they're not you know, you know, certain and not you know, to be realized until until uh, until pretty far down the road. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna eventually, I'm gonna take this question. I think I'm just gonna eventually open it up to everybody, uh, to all the different questions, because it's, you've got a lot of great questions and we have about 25 minutes, so I wanna make sure we can get the cover. I also wanted to point out that we are now joined by Dan Barry. Uh, who is the director of our local and state engagement uh, network. It's an, a project that AAAS has launched uh, about trying to create opportunities uh, and build uh, capacity at the local level to get uh, scientists engaged in decision making. Um, so he'll be able to answer some of the questions that we have gotten uh, on that topic. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Um, and before I get to the question for you, Dana, there's a, a, a ma another major uh, issue I think that we all need recognize is important. And uh, Sean, you alluded to it uh, in, in your talks. Uh, and that has to do with um, our own racial issues here in our country, but also in, in the STEM community. Uh, diversity and equity and inclusion is, is an issue, not only in, in science fields themselves. Um, so what advice do you have for advocating with diversity in mind? And do you think it's, um, let's say, sorry. Is it more or less likely to get um, politicians engaged on these issues? I, I can take a, a stab at this one to start. Um, AAAS right now is engaged in a diversity, equity, and inclusion report that we're gonna put out pretty soon. Um, and what we did basically is we took this issue of diversity and we asked people all across the spectrum in science policy during their history on, on, on science issues, what they thought worked in terms of messaging when people were talking about this. And of course, you can go to AAAS's communications uh, department and we give tips about how to communicate topics like this to various people. And the one thing you want to keep in mind when talking about diversity is who's your audience. You know, if you're talking to um, someone from Brooklyn who's who's you know a member of Congress who's on this issue constantly, they're going to have a different set of ears listening to this issue than someone from say Kansas or Oklahoma or where I'm from, Indiana. So audience is a big thing there to think about and what resonates. One of the messages I will say that I think is pretty important when talking about the diversity issue is not just talking about the moral one but also talking about the practical effect of it. Um, there is a definitive return on investment of having a diversity of people and ideas that produce better outcomes. Um, the analogy that people like to use is fielding the best team possible. You can imagine that if you have a baseball team or any team where everybody only comes from one bent or one ideology or one kind of background, you're not going to have the best results. The best results yield from people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, from all issues, from all diverse walks of life that then produce the best kind of outcomes. So diversity in, in terms of the diversity of ideas yields the best results for this country. Uh, and in a sense, people have actually proven through some scientific literature, that is why America innovates better than others, the, this free exchange of ideas and people. Um, and so I usually try and talk to folks about audience and then also different approaches to talking about diversity in terms of adding to the, what people would consider the justice or the moral arguments. Jo Joanne, I, I, I have something to add and it's a little bit le less about impacting policymakers on that one, but more about 
understanding our own biases. And, and again, I, I wanna call out a Golden Goose Award winner. And these were the researchers who discover, really identified and, and then created the implicit bias test and really dug in deep and tried to understand these biases that we all maintain that many of us don't know we even have. And I think this is a time when I think people in the scientific community and many people like myself who are white males who've probably had it much easier than many, it's worth looking at that science, that scientific work, taking the implicit bias test. We're talking about doing that as an office and then having the discussion because I think it's important for us to realize that we are shaped by our own lived experiences and we need to understand it. But this is again, an example of where social science in this instance has helped to inform us, to help us, I think, become more aware um, and, and, and in this time, something that is a tool to, to better understand uh, some of the challenges and biases we all hold. Right. And AAAS, we actually held a, a, a workshop on a number of years ago on implicit bias with, uh, with pub the publishing community and the federal research community. It was an opportunity, and we, had, and we all did that test. It, it's amazing. Um, but it was an opportunity for publishers to kind of share their data, like kind of like share kind of what they were seeing in terms of the biases that they saw play out as they were considering research articles and what to publish and trying pilot programs to, to incorporate like double blind or triple blinds um, into the system. Because it isn't just about, you know, there's even implicit bias with respect to research institutions. It's not even just about gender and race. Um, it, it's, it comes at lots of different levels and the research community ne needs to work really, really hard at that. Um, and, and research agencies also, uh, you know, were kind of looking at how they could uh, make, a, you know, a positive changes or try out pilot programs to improve um, the grant proposal process um, without, you know, they want to, you know, kind of maintain and respect the merit evaluation process, but they also kind of recognize that they need to, you know, protect against implicit bias. But there's a lot we need to do. I, I think AAAS, we're going to be spending a lot of time um, given this past week to talk um, amongst ourselves about what more we should be doing as an organization, but also as part of a community. We tend to think of ourselves as just, you know, the scientists and we're part of the science, but we're all part, parts of a community as well. Um, part of that question also had to do with um, COVID-19 and, and the disproportionate burden it is on uh, uh, people of color um, and, and people in certain socioeconomic situations. I think you definitely have to bring that up. I think members of Congress are paying attention to that. There's been at least one hearing on that topic. Um, and I'm not sure if there'll be more. There's a lot of data. Uh, this is, is a fluid process. They're gonna be examining this pandemic for many years, you know, for a long time. Uh, and the data um, is going to be very important. And members of Congress, I think, will you know, want to know uh, uh, and hear more about that. Um, okay, so other, so the questions, I'm basically going, there was, you, you're able to upvote these questions, so if I can't, we don't get to answer all these questions, we will try to respond to them, um, at, respond to them separately after, after the webinar is over. Um, so I'm going to kind of switch into, um, so the first, well, um, the first question is, what are some examples of the types of roles that students and graduate students can play, it says within Congress, following completion of their education? Since most congressional members do not come from a scientific background, what types of roles within their staffs could we play to help shape scientific policy? Um, and I'm assuming that means about the different jobs you could have or internships or fellowships. Uh, fellowships was one of the popular questions. Um, but Sean or Toby, since you both worked on the Hill, did you want to touch, grapple with that? I can take a first stab at it. Um, I think that there, there's a couple ways I think about this. For grad students and for undergraduate students doing science advocacy, you have to understand that policymakers may not know when you go in and talk to them that you all are the ones doing the science. So uh, the structure of a grant, there's not a lot of uh, members of Congress that fully understand the pipeline about NSF has a budget. They dole out grants on a merit review process. The grant goes to university, university has a PI, and they have students doing research with the you know, full-time faculty. That entire process 
not always clear to members of Congress. So there's an educational component going in and saying, hey, look, if you're a graduate student and you're receiving a grant, um, explaining what your grant is, how you got it, you know, what, what, what kind of research you're going on, and then you launch into, you know, why should you care? Why should the United States, why should a member of Congress care about the kind of research that I'm doing? And so you tie both the educational component about what, who you are, what you're doing, and then also with the impact that you could potentially have. Um, and just to touch on, you know, a lot of people have asked us over the course of the years, and I mean, this is why AAAS exists in, in some sense of defending or justifying or explaining the vital importance of basic fundamental research. So a lot of folks come to us and say, hey, look, I just do fundamental research. It's not applied. I'm not working on anything like product specific. How do I justify what it is that I do? And AAAS has just an unbelievable amount of resources that detail um, through stories, through compelling examples and narratives, the serendipity and all of these things that come out of basic research, the life that we live now, why is it better? Because some student like yourself, some postdoc like yourself, some research assistant like yourself was fiddling around with some kind of exploratory thing in science funded by the federal government that has now made all of our lives better. Um, it's these kinds of stories that resonate with members of Congress because they do, in a sense, really want to tout the success of America. Uh, you know, what makes us better? What makes us exceptional? What makes us continuing to, to progress? And so I often look at graduate students and researchers. Sometimes you guys come with insecurities to us. You know, how do I justify? And I say, hey, look, you guys are the ones that have the best examples ever. The work that you do makes all of our lives better in very concrete, tangible, relatable ways. And so that's kind of how I approach it in, in that kind of progress, that progression. I'll, I'll just... I'll just add, I, you know, in terms of, I mean, there are certainly job opportunities. I mean, folks with science backgrounds can go get a job and not, it doesn't, I often say people look at the, they, the, they think the only way to get a job in Congress is to get a, who are scientists, is to get a AAAS fellowship. There, there are people who just go and apply for jobs in Congress and actually get them. That's how I got my job right out of school as an undergrad. So somebody with a science background, um, you know, there are certain committees, the science committee, they look for people with PhDs and they look when you're ready. And if you have a crop of fellows who are in the middle of their fellowship, they may not have a fellow they can draw upon. So don't always think you have to get a fellowship. I often say just apply for, apply for those jobs. But I also say, you know, there's, there's great value in, 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 in being engaged before you ever look for a job. You may not ever want a policy job, but Students in particular have a huge impact. I often say that when I worked for MIT in their Washington office, um, I could take the director of the Fusion Center in and uh, it was hard for me to get a meeting for him. It was a $35 million um, center. In fact, with Senator Kennedy staff, I could never get them to call back when I tried to get those meetings. However, when the graduate students wrote and said they were worried about their future, I got a call from that staffer who said, I need to, who, who's a graduate student who will organize this letter? Because I need to talk to them because Ted Kennedy cared a lot about students and he saw them as the future and they wanted to respond. So don't underestimate the value. I often think students are, are just as important for, and, and again, the student vote was, was as important as the lab director's vote. And, and uh, frankly, they brought a lot more students with them in terms of that importance uh, uh, than maybe the lab director did. So I just say that, that don't underestimate and don't think that Congress is the only way to affect policy. There are other positions. You can work for the Government Accountability Office in their Science and Tech Division, and that affects and helps Congress. You can work for CRS, uh, where a lot of PhDs do. There are other places you can work that also impact policymaking that are just as valuable. Thanks, Toby. And, and you know, the, the, our discussion has been primarily focused on DC and Congress, um, but there are a lot of decision makers at the local level. And don't think that you cannot uh, be engaged uh, at, at decision makers in your state. So I'm gonna, this is kind of leads into the next question. I'm gonna incorporate kind of two different questions. One uh, is at the local level, which elected officials, whether commissioners, mayors, et cetera, tend to be the best to communicate? In other words, who's really gonna listen and you're gonna get a result or an actual outcome. 
um, or is it just based on their aims or the position that they hold? Well, politics is still politics, I'll just say that. But also related to that is what, what types of work can, um, can uh, these students do to be an advocate at the local and state um, level if they don't, are not, you know, like have an LSEM, um, you know, campaign in their state. So, so Dan Dion, you've got a lot of work You've done a lot of work at the, at the state level, so why don't you kick that off? Sure, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I would say, to answer the first part of the question, the more local you go, uh, the more access points you're likely to have. Uh, so the local mayor um, is, is a person who's likely to be pretty approachable, um, and also because you live in a community where you could walk or ride your bike or somehow otherwise get to public meetings, you have a lot more opportunity to, to uh, work in person with uh, city council members or county commissioners who represent your community, your neighborhood. Uh, so I think you know those those are great opportunities to uh, to work with local officials who are likely to be responsive, um, but again, importantly, likely to be uh, uh, very approachable. Now, working on the state level is is not that much less accessible. Uh, it might involve a little bit of travel, but the kinds of opportunities that AAAS offers for scientists to come to Washington D.C to uh, you know, participate in committee hearings or to give testimony, uh, to participate in uh, public comment uh, sessions, that kind of thing. These are all available on the state level. Uh, and again, as constituents, your, your ability to open a door um, is really powerful. If you combine that with the expertise and the care that you have for your community and for important issues around science and policy, um, my sense, and we're looking to prove this, through the local science engagement network is that we'll be able to build very active conversations um, through engaging with local and state level lawmakers. A lot of what you've learned over the last hour and a half or two hours here in terms of communications and advocacy and engagement um, apply equally as well to state level officials or local officials. It's about building relationships. It's about understanding how to communicate effectively. Um, also, I'm willing to bet that the majority of local and state level uh, elected officials are, are like members of Congress in terms of not having a tremendous amount of scientific training. The critical difference, however, is that um, local and state level elected officials have far less money and staff to work with. Uh, our pilot project in Colorado, um, I happen to know that state legislators in Colorado have um, a budget that affords them a 0.25 full-time equivalent for their personal staff, a quarter of a person. And so, you know, to cover the entire range of policy issues that they're considering, um, science just does not, does not rise to the level of um, having a, a real full voice uh, for a particular member of the Colorado State Legislature. So how in Colorado or any state, Missouri, another of our pilot states or Georgia, where similarly they're gonna face sh uh, staffing shortages and funding shortages for this kind of work. My sense is, and again, we're, we're piloting this project to prove whether or not the science community gains more power and more influence in these settings where uh, the elected officials have far fewer resources to draw upon. That's what we're hoping to prove. And, um, you know, just again, by way of background, this is a brand new project for, uh, for AAAS, and we're re really excited about the pilot program that we're testing in our three uh, primary states. But as Joanne said, we're, we're keeping an eye on the future as well. How can we build a platform and build a set of resources that any scientist anywhere can use to build a relationship with their lawmaker, whether it starts with a particular policy objective in mind initially or grows towards that. And so that's, that's a, a lot of the, the infrastructure and the, and the technical support that we're investing in right now. Uh, we will leverage the same exact kind of really high level quality training that AAAS and other science societies have offered historically on science communications, civic engagement, effective and appropriate advocacy, um, and then some additional stuff that, you know, uh, anybody could use some more training on, how to engage with the media, how to lead a meeting, um, how, to, how to engage in a public comment period. There are some real specific skill sets that uh, most scientists don't learn in, you know, in undergrad or graduate or PhD classes. Um, and there, you know, I, I, there, a lot of people use the, well, it's like riding a bike. Once you learn how to do it, you just know how to do it. It's not just like riding a bike. It's more like playing an instrument. 
Um, to do good engagement, to do good communications, you really have to get ongoing training and you have to practice, practice, practice. So that's, you know, that's stuff that AAAS has, has known for a long time. And it's a, a set of, uh, you know, it's an orientation that we're bringing into the local science engagement network uh, as well. So um, we're really excited to get it going and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll get you more information uh, ongoing as to when we officially launch the national component of this thing, because I'd love to sign as many of you up as possible to get involved um, and use our platform to build relationships with your local elected leaders. Um, again, on that introductory level, just to let them know I'm a constituent, I'm a scientist and I'm here to help. Or as you and your colleagues or uh, organizations that you work with identify science policy issues in, in your town or uh, in the state that you, know, you really care about, then there, there's an opp opportunity for collective action among groups of scientists who, who really want to weigh in and influence uh, local and state policy. So. Thank you, Dan. And that reminds me, um, I, I neglected to, to let you know that we know that this was just two hours and we cannot cover everything that you would possibly want. Uh, but so we have a poll uh, to ask you all, like what other topics that you would like to have us cover in any future webinar. So that will be something that our uh, the support staff here will be uh, posting soon. So please do uh, vote for what you would like to have covered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, okay. So uh, it's funny that you said practice, 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 because that was one of the, uh, <laughs> this was in the next question, is that the fact is that graduate school students are not really focused, they're not really supported in, in, in kind of pursuing communication or interest in policy. They're, they're, working with their peers on research. Um, so what skills or venture we be developing during, during their PhDs to make them effective communicators or, or is it just practice, practice, practice? Participating in this webinar obviously is one of them, um, but Erin, do you want to uh, take that? Yeah, certainly, thanks. Yeah, I think it is about practice to an extent and it's about seeking out opportunities. So I mentioned some before, including getting involved with your scientific society, as well as joining some of the networks that we mentioned where scientists and engineers and grad students are working together to engage in policy. These are some great ways to learn and to gain new skills. I would also add just every chance you get to communicate your science to a non-scientific audience will be incredibly helpful as you engage in policy going forward. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is, is a bit more niche. Uh, it's, it says, how do you feel about the Rural STEM Education Act? Uh, that's a bill that was introduced by uh, Representative, or Ranking Member Lucas. He, he's Ranking Member in the House Science Committee uh, to, uh, to, to provide support for NSF to support rural STEM education. Uh, AAAS is, we don't generally endorse bills, um, but uh, rural education, well, the, the future of STEM education are, right now is kind of in flux, um, and, and we don't know where that will be going, but um, uh, I kind of open that up. Uh, Toby, I don't know, does AAU have a formal position on that? No, we so, don't, and I'm not familiar with it, so I'm not, I'm not the best person to comment on it. Right, I'm not, we are not either, um, but um, STEM education at all levels, uh, rural, rural communities in particular, I think face, there's certain techn technological challenges as well in terms of having, you know, internet, high, you know, high speed internet access. Uh, but I think the whole uh, nature of, of education is going to be different as students consider going to community colleges versus, you know, deferring a year and attending community colleges versus uh, you know, um, um, uh, four-year institutions. The whole nature of education, I think, is going to change uh, even in between rural and urban settings. Uh, so I'm sorry, we'll, we could try and, and follow up with that um, within more detail later. And I will say one thing, because it's, you know, we often think that you have to, and again, I can't, I grew up in a rural area, although my background isn't, isn't I didn't get a, uh, you know, um, degree in, in, in STEM, but, uh, I, I do think a lot about the connections that that scientists can make, and there are some great, great programs like Skype a Scientist, and the fact that a lot of rural, as well as inner city uh, STEM teachers, don't know a real scientist. They don't. They they they've never met one, and the fact that you can now, and especially as we've gone through, and everybody's gotten to become experts at Zoom, 
you realize how easy it is to connect to places and how a graduate student could 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 give a talk to their you know high school chemistry uh, teachers class day when they graduated you know 10 years earlier so it's worth just thinking about how you reconnect and stay in touch with those areas and help help in some of those areas and, and it's another way to get people on board to support support the importance of science uh, in the policy world too. Right. And yeah. if I could just offer, you know, uh, touching back on the local science engagement network, the, the rural urban divide is something that we've been addressing with our partners from the very beginning, acknowledging that um, the, the typical science policy issues that, that arise in urban areas are vastly different from those that are being struggled with in urban areas, in rural areas. So, uh, we've built into our policy mapping, which will help us guide the sorts of engagements that we pursue, um, an acknowledgement that we have to build partnerships and relationships with elected leaders and other leaders who represent and can discuss urban issues or uh, rural issues as they come up. Um, and, you know, relating back to a previously uh, asked question about uh, diversity in frontline communities, it's it's another thing we're trying to build into our local science engagement network, acknowledging that there are three sort of large buckets of leaders that we can engage with through this network. One um, are elected leaders and their staff, and they're very important. There's a second important bucket, which is you know, business leaders and uh, organizational leaders that work um, in our states or in our localities. And yet a third bucket, which are community leaders. And there are a lot of community leaders out there that are critically important for us to engage with who don't hold an elected or an appointed or a hired position. They are community activists in the truest sense of the word, and that's where you'll typically find people who are dealing with disparity issues, access issues, um, and they are, you know, they're, they're oftentimes under, um, you know, overlooked and, and underappreciated, and we're tr trying to really force people in the uh, local science engagement network to um, select a leader or two from each of those three broad categories to um, broaden the access and the, and the connections that we build, but also you learn different communications and engagement skills by, by engaging with different uh, target audiences. And I think a well-rounded set of skills is really important uh, for anybody who wants to do this as either a professional pursuit or a personal avocation. Thanks, Dan. Um, I know Toby and Dan have a hard stops at three. Uh, technically, we are past start time. Um, but I wanted to thank them both. I don't know, T Toby or Dan, if you wanted to say any last words. Thank you. I'm happy to be in touch with people who are interested in the science engagement at work, and thanks for the time, y'all. Um, I appreciated joining the panel briefly. Thank you. Fine. I'll just say the same thing. I, I think I concluded my talk with really just appreciation for people's interest and, and that uh, it really is important that people be involved, be engaged, uh, do it effectively, and um, make their voices heard. So I, I think, um, especially with people who think like scientists, because I, I think that 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 is essential and important in these in the given the challenges we're currently facing. So appreciate everybody um, taking time to to be with us today. Thanks, Toby. So. We're going to have to come to a conclusion um, at this point. Uh, we wish that we could spend more time, but uh, we are going to look to organize more webinars. Um, and we're going to, if uh, Chloe, if my co colleague Chloe um, could share the screen, we've got the contact information. We're just gonna kind of show one last time uh, so you can see uh, how to um, get in touch with us. Uh, again, we will. All, we had a lot of questions. There are like 30 questions we have not gotten to, um, and we will respond to those separately. Uh, we are going to make these slides available, and we will uh, include them in um, uh, uh, probably on the case website, right, Chloe? So, and I want to also give a shout out to Chloe, who was hiding most of the time, didn't get to show her face. So she is uh, an important part. She works very closely with our case students. Many of you probably may already know her, as well as with ESEP. Um, and uh, just, um, we're going to, um, well, she's uh, also has some perspectives with the uh, fellowship program. So she's a good point of contact there as well. 
So with that, i um, like to thank you all for your time, uh, for your interest and for your questions. Uh, please remember that your voice really is important. Uh, graduate students, you are the future of science, you're the future of innovation, you're the future of our workforce, and from a political perspective, you're the future voters, so they do really want to listen to you. <laughs> they prefer listening to you than to, to us in, some, in many ways. So please um, continue learning, uh, being engaged, and ask questions. Thank you very much.